this section we're going to cover liquidating distributions. A liquidating distribution or series of distributions terminates a partner's interest in the partnership. And then gain recognition is going to follow the same basic distribution taxation scheme as we've talked about in non-liquidating -liqui non distributions. But unlike in non-liquidating distributions, loss recognition is going to be allowed here, which is disallowed on a current distribution. A loss is going to be allowed when the liquidating distribution consists of money, unrealized receivables and inventory, but no other property, and the partner's basis in the partnership exceeds the total basis of these distributed properties. So again, to recognize a loss, your distribution at your liquidating distribution must only consist of money, unrealized receivables, and inventory. The partner's basis in the assets it receives is going to be determined as the same, the same as a non-liquidating distribution with some exceptions. So remember, on non-liquidating distribution, we generally took a the partnership's basis. The partner took the partnership's basis. So that's the general rule we follow here, except for these two exceptions. If the partner's basis in the partnership is so small that reduction for money distributions reduces that basis below the partnership's basis for unrealized receivables and inventory, that remaining basis in the partnership must be allocated. And we allocate it among unrealized receivables and inventory items based first on their decline in value and then on the relative basis as adjusted to reflect the decline in value. So what this is saying is if, as a partner, I receive a liquidating distribution and that, distri that my basis in the partnership is so small that first, I always reduce that basis by money. After that, whatever's less left, I allocate to receivables and inventory. And then whatever is left, my next step would be to allocate to other property. But in this situation, they're saying the basis is so small that the amount to allocate to unrealized receivables and inventory is below the partnership's basis in those assets. In that case, we have to allocate between those two, and we allocate first based on the decline in value and then on the relative adjusted basis between the two. Okay, in the second bullet point, if there's no loss allowed because the property received is other than money, unrealized receivables and inventory, so I get some, I get a building or something, the remaining basis in the partnership must be allocated to other property received regardless of that property's basis to the partnership or its fair market value. So any leftover basis I have in the partnership has to be allocated to that asset I received that was other than money, unrealized receivables, and inventory. And it doesn't matter if that basis is crazy high compared to its fair, fair market value, but it's going to be allocated regardless. If there are multiple assets and the amount to be allocated is greater than the carryover basis of the distributed assets, the basis is first allocated among the distributed assets in an amount equal to their carryover basis. Then we further allocate based on relative appreciation of the assets up to the amount of appreciation. And then if there's more basis to allocate, we allocate based on relative fair market values. Money plus the distributee partner's total basis of non-cash property received is generally going to equal the partner's basis in their partnership interest. So this makes sense because we're basically changing forms of ownership. My basis in the partnership is often or almost always going to equal the basis of the assets I receive in liquidation of the partnership in total. So cash, money, whatever. The two exceptions are when a partner either recognizes gain or loss, because we know if we recognize gain, we get to increase the basis. If we recognize loss, we, we decrease the basis. The holding period of the assets received is going to include the partnership's holding period for the property, and it may also include the holding period of the contributing partner, because remember, at the formation of the partnership, if a partner contributed assets most of the time, the partnership took a a holding period that included the partner's holding period. If that was the case, the partner that takes the assets after the liquidating distribution also takes that carryover holding period, whatever the partnerships was. The holding period of the partnership interest is irrelevant. So if partner A has only been a partner for six months and receives a liquidating distribution, if the partnership holding period of that asset was 10 years, the partner A gets a holding period of 10 years, regardless of the fact that partner A was only a partner for six months. 
and then the character of the gain or loss recognized on the subsequent sale of distributed property is determined using the same rules as for a current distribution. So remember back to our current distribution, if we were, if we were distributed assets like inventory or unrealized receivables and we later sold those, there are some rules that make that income usually ordinary income, right? So inventory within five years, unrealized receivables, ordinary income to the partner that received that distribution. Otherwise, it's generally a capital gain or loss. In problem 30, the CL partnership has two partners, Clio and Leo. Each partner's basis in his or her partnership interest is $10,000 before any distribution. The partnership distributes $12,000 cash to Leo and $8,000, excuse me, $12,000 cash to Clio and $8,000 to Leo. A, assuming a current distribution, determine for each partner, one, the gain or loss recognized, and two, the basis in the partnership interest after, after the distribution. So this is not a liquidating distribution in A. So it says that we receive cash, both Clio and Leo receive cash, and the basis in their partnership is 10,000 each. So we know for Clio that cash is gonna exceed that basis, so we're gonna have a gain. For Leo, we're, we're not gonna have to worry about a gain because the cash does not exceed the basis. So you can see part A up here. Clio recognizes a $2,000 gain because the cash Cleo received was 12,000 and the basis was 10,000. Leo recognizes no gain, but the basis in Leo's partnership interest is now 2,000 because we subtract distributions from basis. And back to Cleo, Cleo's basis is zero. B, assuming it's a liquidating distribution now, determine each partner's gain or loss recognized. All right, so now these, these partners are, will no longer be partners. So in part B for Clio, we have a $2,000 gain. Again, Clio received $12,000 cash. The basis was $10,000. That results in a gain. But Leo has a loss now because, remember, Leo's basis in the partnership was $10,000, and Leo only received $8,000 in complete liquidation of that interest. So that is a loss. And Leo is allowed to recognize the loss because only cash was distributed. We also have to worry about Section 751 hot assets when we talk about liquidating distributions. If we have Section 751 assets, they receive similar treatment for liquidating distributions as they did for current distributions. But the difference is that, of course, there's no post-distribution interest in partnership assets because it's a liquidating distribution, so that partner is no longer a partner in the partnership. The effect of a liquidating distribution on the partnership is as follows. Generally, there's no gain or loss on a liquidating distribution made to the partners unless we have a 751 sale. And the liquidating distribution does not terminate the partnership unless there are no remaining partners can, to continue the operation. So one partner can leave without termination of the partnership. All right, in problem 32, we have Miranda, a one-third partner in the MWH partnership before she receives a $100,000 cash liquidating distribution. Immediately before she receives the distribution, the partnership has the following assets, cash, marketable securities, and land. At the time of the distribution, the partnership has $30,000 of outstanding liabilities, which the three partners share equally. Miranda's basis in her partnership interest before the distribution was $80,000, which includes her share of liabilities. What are the amount and character of the gain or loss recognized by Marinda and the partnership on the liquidating distribution? So first thing we need to check is whether or not we think we'll have a section 751 issue. And so we need to look at these assets. We do not have inventory or unrealized receivables, and we don't have any potential depreciation recapture because we only have land. And remember, land is not depreciable. So we don't have a Section 751 issue. Since we know we don't have that, we just need to see her basis compared to what she received. So and it tells you the answer. Of course, $30,000 capital gain for Miranda, no gain for the partnership. Um, her, As we said, her distribution isn't proportionate. She received all cash, but it doesn't matter here because there were no Section 751 assets. So she received $100,000 cash and she received a release from her liability. 
And remember the liability was $30,000 total and the partners shared it equally. So the fact that she was relieved from that is a deemed distribution. So she is deemed to have been paid $110,000 for her interest. And her basis in the partnership was $80,000. So she has a capital gain of $30,000. And the partnership is going to recognize no gain. In 33, we have the AB partnership. It pays its only liability, which is a $100,000 mortgage, on April 1st of the current year and terminates that same day. Allison and Bob were equal partners in the partnership, but have partnership bases immediately preceding these transactions of $110,000 and $180,000 respectively, including his or her share of liabilities. The two partners receive identical distributions with each receiving the following assets. So we have cash, inventory, receivables, building, and land. And one thing you, uh, you notice here is that there are Section 751 assets. There's inventory and receivables and the building. But you also notice that they re they're equal partners and they each received these assets. So what were their names? So Allison received $20,000 cash and Bob received $20,000 cash. Allison received $33,000 or $35,000 of inventory. So did Bob. So it's an equal distribution in proportion to their share. So even though we have 751 hot assets, they were proportionally distributed. So we're not going to have a 751 problem. What are the tax implications to Allison, Bob, and the partnership on the April 1 transactions? Okay, so first we, we need to look at Allison and Bob and their basis and what they received. So their basis before we started anything was $110,000 for Allison and $180,000 for Bob. Remember that when we redeem liabilities, then it is a deemed distribution. So when the partnership paid off the liabilities, it was a deemed distribution to Allison and Bob and distributions reduced basis. So after that, their remaining basis are $60,000 and $130,000. Then we subtract the cash. We just got that from this chart. Cash distributions reduced basis again. So now Allison has $40,000 of basis and Bob has $110,000. So we next allocate to inventory and receivables. And you can see here they each received fair market value of $42,000 of receivables and basis of $43,000 of receivables. Well, for Allison, you can see that is more than the basis that she has left to be allocated. So we have to allocate, as I'll show you on the next slide, we have to allocate this $40,000 of basis to inventory and receivables for Allison. And then she is out of basis. So you can see there's nothing else to allocate to the land in the building. So looking over here to Bob though, Bob has a $110,000 basis left to allocate before inventory and receivables. So we allocate to Bob the partnership's basis in the inventory and receivables, so $33,000 and $10,000. And after that, Bob still has more basis to allocate. So we are gonna allocate basis to the land in the building that Bob takes. So going back to Allison, inventory and receivables will allocate based on this slide. Okay, so we first give each asset the partnership's basis for the asset. And remember, Allison has $43,000, wait, $40,000 left to allocate. All right, so step one gives inventory the $33,000 basis of the partnership and the receivables the $10,000 basis of the partnership. Step two, after step one, we allocate the decrease first to the assets that have declined in value. So remember, we have a we only have $40,000 of basis to allocate, and the partnership gives it $43,000. So we have to reduce that somehow. Our first step is to reduce it for the assets that have declined in value, and that's the receivables. They have a basis of $10,000 but a value of eight. dollars so of that $3,000 decline we have to allocate, we start by allocating the $2,000 of it to the receivables. So now we have the receivables with an $8,000 basis and the inventory with a $33,000 basis. That's still $41,000. We only need it to be forty. dollars So in step three, we're going to allocate the remaining $1,000 decrease based on relative adjusted basis at this point. So you can see the calculation down at the bottom of your chart. But the total 
adjusted basis at this point is 41,000. And we allocate based on relative adjusted basis at this point. So for example, allocating to inventory, we take 33,000 divided by 33,000 plus 8,000 times what we want to allocate. And we'd allocate 805 there. For receivables, we would take 8,000 divided by 33,000 plus 8,000 times 1,000, which would give us 195. So our basis now in the inventory for Allison is 32,195, and the receivables is 78,05. You can see that on this chart. And again, she has no basis left to allocate to the land in the building. So she has the land in building. She still takes it. It just has a zero basis. So when she sells it, there will be a big gain. For Bob, remember, he had enough basis to allocate the partnership's basis in the inventory and receivables. After that, he has $67,000 of basis left. And the basis of the land in the building is $70,000. So we're going to allocate to Bob like this. So we start, of course, by giving each asset the partnership's basis in the asset. So the land in the building have a $40,000 and a $15,000 basis. So a total basis of $55,000. All right, after that, we still have $12,000 of basis to allocate. And we do this first in step two, we allocate that $12,000 first to assets that have appreciated in value. So the building has appreciated in value by $20,000 and we only have $12,000 to allocate. So we allocate the $12,000 there, giving Bob a basis of 15,000 in the land, and 52,000 in the building.